So in this lecture, we will talk briefly about the roles, respectively, of NADH and NADPH. So these are cofactors that have a, a very different perspective in terms of what they do for metabolism inside the cell. So first and foremost, uh, one of the most common mistakes that I see uh, students make in biochemistry one is sort of conflating and confusing this idea of oxidation and reduction. So these two cofactors switch between an oxidized form, uh, which is a form that would usually have a plus charge assigned to it. So NAD plus or NAD P plus is oxidized. So any reaction in which um, it will reduce something uh, in terms of transferring hydrogen, in turn, these two cofactors will get oxidized. Now on the flip side, if you're looking for something that is reduced, you want to think about um, the molecule, in this case, these two cofactors, NADH and NADPH, as being sort of reduced with hydrogen. So reduced form or reduction sort of implies it's reduced with hydrogen atoms. So um, these are hydrogen carriers, and they'll give away hydrogens and reduce something else. So that's what they're going to do in the cell in a wide array of metabolic reactions. And then to sort of tie this up, um, you know, there's different forms and incarnations of this hydrogen. So in Gen Chem 1, we learn about the proton, which is just simply H+. That is a hydrogen that has lost an electron. Remember, hydrogen is one proton and one electron. Well, if you lose that electron, it becomes H+. And that's also known as a proton. And that's something that really you... Um, studied a lot in acid-base chemistry, right? It contributes to pH. And then uh, a hydrogen as is with its electron, um, we just call that an electron. So the idea of reducing equivalence, um, that is when these give away their reducing equivalence, it's just a fancy way of saying they're giving electrons. And then finally, we have hydride ion. So that's a hydrogen atom that's picked up another electron. And when it does, it sort of confers upon it a negative charge. So we'll see hydride ion transfers, particularly with NADH, or maybe even with NADPH. So hydride ion transfers, uh, the alcohol dehydrogenase mechanism, the lactate dehydrogenase mechanism, all of those are hydride ion transfer, transfers, excuse me, facilitated by NADH. Uh, probably the most important point here is that NADPH and NADH are not equivalent and they're not identical. So there's totally different roles within the cell and totally different uh, cytoplasmic concentrations in terms of the NADPH pool and the NADH pool. So um, the first important point I'd like to tell um, you guys is that these are not interchangeable. They have totally different functionalities, totally different responsibilities within the confines of the cell. Second important point I'd like to reiterate is this idea of reducing equivalence. NADH and NADPH give away reducing equivalence. In other words, they can give away electrons and reduce something else. When they reduce something else, they in turn become oxidized. So there's this, um, there's this constant shuttling between the oxidized and reduced form or the reduced form and the oxidized form. So here is the structure of NADH and NADPH is exactly the same, but I'd like to bring your attention to this uh, X here, that green X. Um, if it's a hydrogen, you just have plain old NADH. And if you replace that green X with a phosphate, inorganic phosphate, then you have NADPH or NADPH. P plus if it's giving away uh, its reducing equivalence. So the structure is exactly the same. The only difference is uh, the phosphate. And uh, boy, what a difference that makes because that phosphate in the form of NADPH or NADP plus has totally different roles in the cell and totally different um, ratios between the oxidized and reduced form. Remember, the reduced form is the form that's going to have H's on them. So that's about 0.10 in a typical cell, the ratio between the oxidized and the reduced inside the cell. So usually the reduced form is more prevalent. Now, contrast that with uh, NADH, um, which again is mostly um, 
involved in enzymatic reactions, uh, such as the dehydrogenation reactions that we studied in glycolysis. Again, think of your uh, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase, uh, those types of uh, enzymes. Well, when we look at that, the ratio between the oxidized and the reduced form is about 1,000. So uh, in a typical cell, the oxidized form of NAD plus is more prevalent. Uh, in a typical cell, the NADPH form is more prevalent, but not as much, right? Ratio of 0.10 over a ratio of 1,000. Uh, these are definitely involved in more of the um, metabolic reactions uh, in the cell. These are definitely involved in sort of maintaining um, some sort of redox balance within the cell. So differences between the structures are very slight. They happen right here, a phosphate versus a hydrogen, where the hydride ion or hydrogen ion or the reducing equivalents where they get transferred is right here. So um, what happens is that NAD plus will pick up two electrons. Uh, one of the electrons will go here, highlighted in a yellow, and then another one of the um, electrons sort of uh, becomes a proton, it sort of becomes a carrier. So we often say uh, NADH plus a proton. So one of the H's gets that bond here, and then another H becomes a proton. So this is the reduced form of NADH or NADPH if you're talking about a phosphate here. So structurally, uh, most of the uh, reducing equivalents and their, and their transference, or they get their reducing equivalents right here in the nicotinamide region of the structure. So nicotinamide comes from niacin, uh, so we need that vitamin in our body for us to make, for the cell to biosynthesize, that is to say, um, NADH and NADPH. In fact, uh, lack of niacin leads to the, the disease known as pellagra. And looking more into the structure here, we have the ribose ring. We uh, should see that, uh, have some familiarity with that from our discussions on sugars and the ribose ring. And then here we have the adenosine ring, uh, the nitrogenous base of adenosine attached to another sugar here, another ribose sugar. This probably looks more like our nucleotides uh, that we really didn't study in biochemistry one, but this um, has that similar structure uh, that's very much like our DNA and RNA. Uh, but again, the main point here is that the reducing equivalence, the transference of the hydrogens or the transference of the electrons happens right here uh, in the nic nicotinamide ring. Again, the main point of this slide is that different uh, cytoplasmic uh, ratios between oxidized and reduced. And in the next slide, we'll talk about the different functionalities that NADH and NADPH have. So let's first talk about NADH or NAD+. Again, remember oxidized versus reduced. Um, this should be a review from biochemistry one. Uh, we're talking about um, oxidation and reduction reactions um, that are happening in the cell by certain types of enzymatic reactions, like your alcohol dehydrogenase, lactate dehydrogenase. Uh, this is an enzyme from glycolysis, um, if you remember, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. Uh, all these three enzymes, some of them will um, give NADH, some of them will give NAD plus uh, as the products. So in the cell, that's what NADH would prim primarily do. In fact, most of these enzymes have dehydrogenase attached to their names. Um, NADH also gives their reducing equivalents or gives their electrons to the electron transport chain. Uh, and that's a very important process that happens in the mitochondria of eukaryotic cells and it facilitates respiration. Um, NADH and, or NAD plus is a cofactor for many types of um, cells, enzymes in cells in involved in oxidation reduction reactions, also known as redox reactions. And um, the NADH pool in the cytoplasm is different than the NADH pool in the uh, mitochondria. And that balance is made by what's known as the malate aspartate shuttle, something we will not talk about uh, in this particular lecture, but um, it's not like there's a free flow between the two compartments in the cell. In fact, um, it's purposefully divided. Uh, the NADH 
um, concentration of the cytoplasm uh, will be separate than the NADH concentration in the mitochondria. And if there were to be any permeabilities, you would need a transport system. <laughs> now let's talk about NADPH. So this is the version of nicotinamide that has a fake group attached. And boy, what a difference it makes, as I alluded to before. Uh, one of the things NADPH is involved in is reductive biosynthesis. It's not just biosynthesis, but reductive. So there's definitely um, a reduction that's going on as you biosynthesize some of these very important molecules in the cell. Um, hydroxylation is also very important and mediated by NADPH. So to biosynthesize fatty acids, to biosynthesize cholesterol or the other steroids, uh, some of the neurotransmitters, uh, even nucleotides that we'll talk about later on in the course, the purines and the pyrimidines, all of these require NADPH. They do not require NADH. Uh, so that's a very important point. You cannot just simply switch one for the other. Another uh, important role of NADPH is free radical detoxification. So during metabolism, you produce a lot of free radicals, and those free radicals can damage lipids. If it's a neuronal uh, membrane and damages those lipids, it can definitely lead to um, an inability to conduct uh, nervous nerve transmission, or it could mess up your DNA, or it could mess up any part in the cell, these free radicals that are just a normal byproduct of aerobic metabolism. And the cell has ways to guard against this. And one of the ways it guards against this production of free radicals uh, is through the aid and assistance of NADPH. Uh, two systems shown here that the cell has, uh, one of them is working with glutathione, sort of a partner of this molecule that sort of has its own intracellular pool. And another um, aspect are the cytochrome P450 monoxy monooxygenases. So the 450 represents the uh, absorption uh, of wavelength that these heme epicenter proteins absorb maximally at. So free radical detoxification is a very important aspect of the cell. If you don't have it, it can lead to many diseases and NADPH is intimately involved in that. So uh, as a byproduct of normal metabolism, you can actually um, get superoxide you can actually get hydrogen peroxide. Uh, this is also, I should say, very common in the electron transport chain where electrons get funneled uh, and finally reach their terminal electron acceptor oxygen. But it happens one electron at a time. So if it happens at one electron at a time, there's this potential for superoxide to escape or be produced. Now that superoxide can combine with another electron with some hydrogens around, uh, particularly it can combine with water and give you hydrogen peroxide. So hydrogen peroxide is not a good molecule to have inside the cell. We do have catalase, which can detoxify it. But if that hydrogen peroxide gets hit with another free radical hit uh, or free radical damage, it could lead to some other disastrous molecules like these like this hydroxyl radical. And then once again, all these radicals do is they try to find stability. So they'll react and they'll react with anything and everything that's inside the cell. The problem is that um, if it reacts with your DNA, your DNA gets becomes a radical. If it reacts with your membrane lipids, your membrane lipids become a radical and it sort of sets off this chain reaction. So uh, thankfully to the rescue are these detoxification enzymes. And uh, one of them that I want to bring your attention to is glutathione peroxidase. So while superoxide dismutase can definitely um, sort of remove that superoxide, it's glutathione peroxidase that kind of removes the hydrogen peroxide so that this step uh, can never happen in the first place. So let's talk a little bit about the structure of glutathione. So this is a whole separate topic in dealing with glutathione and how that works inside the cell. For now, just realize that glutathione has its own intracellular pool inside the cell, and it's a main detoxification tripeptide. And the amino acids that make up this tripeptide are glycine, cysteine, and there you see uh, that thiol group, again, coming back to reduced versus oxidized. Uh, the thiol group here is in the reduced form. 
And then the third amino acid rounding this out is glutamate. Just want to bring your attention here, this peptide bond is actually attached to the side chain of glutamate. So we call that an isopeptide bond. So glutathione for now is just helps in this free radical removal inside the cell as a byproduct of aerobic metabolism. And the way it does that is it cycles between um, the reduced form and then this form here, the oxidized form. So how do you get the oxidized form of glutathione? Um, this um, glutathione will react with another glutathione, giving us a disulfide bond. So the disulfide bond, again, the oxidized reduced form, the disulfide bond is the oxidized form of glutathione. The reduced form is the one that has the free thiol groups. So what happens is if we're looking at glutathione peroxidase, here we have, if you look at the reaction, here we have the NADPH, there's that proton coming along for the ride. The NADPH, uh, which is what we get from the pentose phosphate pathway, the NADPH gets oxidized, we remove hydrogens, in turn, where do those electrons go? The electrons go to reduce glutathione. And what does that reduce glutathione do? It picks up those electrons from hydrogen peroxide. And in turn, hydrogen peroxide gets detoxified to the very safe water molecule. So this is kind of like a mini um, electron transfer. Uh, and you'll see this a lot um, as we move on throughout the course. Another example of this is ribonucleotide reductase, which is important in RNA synthesis. Uh, once again, let's go through that cycle. The NADPH coming from the pentose phosphate pathway gets oxidized. Those electrons in turn um, reduce glutathione, reduce the disulfide bond. Now, in order to regenerate the oxidized form and another cycle to occur, the substrate hydrogen peroxide, this toxic species, uh, gets detoxified to two water molecules. So the mechanism is complicated. All of this happens within the active site of the enzyme, and um, that's what glutathione uh, reductase in partnership with glutathione peroxidase does. So this is one enzyme in the cascade, I should say, and then this is the second enzyme in the cascade. Glutathione is that mediator, and this is what it does in the cell. But uh, the important point to realize here, at least for this lecture, is what NADPH is doing. It sort of sets uh, the stage for glutathione to detoxify the very bad hydrogen peroxide. A couple of more things. This is an immune system uh, mediator, NADPH, uh, working in collaboration with uh, leukocytes, monocytes, and macrophages. And um, so if we can think for a second about what white blood cells do, uh, particularly leukocytes and that type of lineage, um, they phagocytose, which means they engulf foreign particles, and those foreign particles can be bacteria. So once housed inside the, bacteria, uh, housed inside the white blood cell, the, um, the lysosome, which is this acidic organelle inside the phagocyte, um, sort of captures and encapsulates the foreign invader, in this case, the bacteria. So what happens inside that is a way to sort of kill the bacteria. And it does it through what's known as a respiratory burst. Now inside the lysosome, which is this acidic organelle housed inside the immune phago, a white blood cell where phagocytosis happens, um, here you wanna have a respiratory burst. And you don't wanna have a respiratory burst if you are exercising vigorously because that free radical can really damage your cells and tissues. But inside a white blood cell within the lysosome, you want to have a respiratory burst of free oxygen, oxygenated radicals to kill the bacteria. And that's what uh, NADPH does here uh, in conjunction with the enzyme NADPH oxidase. So what that actually does is it generates free radicals. It generates the superoxide anion, uh, which kills the bacteria. The superoxide anion actually in turn uh, through another enzyme here, uh, this is called the myeloperoxidase system. Uh, the myeloperoxidase system will take the superoxide anion, convert it to hydrogen peroxide, and that's just another chemical that can sterilize and kill the bacteria. It also produces chlorine anion, um, 
It also produces hypochloride anion. These, these things help uh, initiate a killing cascade of the bacteria. So that's what NADPH does uh, in NADPH oxidase. So this is a complicated enzyme, the NADPH oxidase. There's a whole other, uh, a lot of cofactors that are involved. I believe tetrahydrofolate is involved. So um, this is a multi-tiered, multi-cofactor enzyme, NADPH uh, oxidase. But the NADPH, again, is very important uh, in terms of killing, again, the free radical detoxification inside the white blood cell. People who have um, a mutation or a lack of NADPH oxidase uh, have a disease known as CGD, chronic granulomatous disease. And what happens is that, uh, well, you have no NADPH oxidase for whatever reason, it's not functioning or mutated. And um, so you do not have the respiratory burst. Without the respiratory burst, the bacteria very much remains alive. They don't get killed. There is no killing action. So uh, this is a cutaneous version that I downloaded uh, from the actual uh, CGD website. And these nodules are actually uh, bacteria infestations. Uh, this is the cutaneous form. More severe forms can actually infect the liver, it can infect the kidneys, it can go and disseminate to the organ systems. Uh, but what happens here is again, these nodules, uh, these bumps of these swollen, very sensitive areas filled with bacteria that have yet to be killed because of a lack of respiratory burst coming from an inefficient or improperly functioning NADPH oxidase. So here we see NADPH uh, involved uh, with white blood cells, particularly activated leukocytes. Uh, continuing with our theme here of detoxification, NADPH is involved in the P450 system. So P450, uh, cytochrome P450, uh, is um, an enzyme that has a heme epicenter. We see cytochromes a lot in the electron transport chain. The 450 represents its wavelength absorption maxima. Um, FAD and FN and the flavin electron carriers are also involved. Uh, but the initiator here, once again, is NADPH. NADPH, along with the proton that comes for the ride, gets oxidized. And where do the electrons go? Um, the electrons go to this substrate. Now, if you're talking about the mitochondria, um, the P450 system will actually go and hydroxylate important molecules for the cell, such as cholesterol. It could hydroxylate vitamins, particularly forming vitamin D3. Uh, it can also hydroxylate on top of that vitamin D3 once again, uh, which is what we see in the kidney. So basically uh, what I'm trying to say is it participates in hydroxylation reactions, which are important for reductive biosynthesis. Again, that theme of reductive biosynthesis is important, which we saw in a couple of slides back was important for fatty acids, steroids, uh, neurotransmitters, so on and so forth. Um, if you're talking about anything other than the mitochondrial system, or anything other than the liver and the kidney, that type of system. Uh, we can also consider the P450 system as a way to remove um, toxic substances. So just as you hydroxylate cholesterol in its metabolic pathway, just as you hydroxylate um, the, the molecules cholecalciferol, we do not need to know that, but uh, if you hydroxylate cholecalciferol, you get vitamin D3. And so this is important for the cell. Um, but if you have in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum microsomes, uh, these hydroxylations are important to remove or detoxify drugs, pollutants, or pesticides. So um, any type of drug, when you hydroxylate that, again, um, the importance of NADPH should be um, noticed here. Um, when you help and facilitate this hydroxylation through this P450 cycle, um, it sort of helps solubilize the drug to activate it. It sort of solubilizes the pollutant, the pesticide, the toxic chemical, and uh, in order to deactivate it and make it get excreted through the urine or fecal matter. So what we see here above is metabolism. Um, 
that's necessary, whether it's cholesterol or vitamin metabolism. What we see here um, in the microsomal system in the smooth ER is a way to just rid of toxic substances. And you can see here an entire cycle, uh, the P450 cycle, mediated by NADPH, which sort of sets the electrons going to this cytochrome P450 and allows substances to get hydroxylated ultimately for whatever is destined to be, whether it's destined to be um, cholesterol metabolism or vitamin D metabolism, or whether it's destined to be removed from the cell and go into the urine or feces. Uh, final uh, NADPH use has to do with nitric oxide synthase. Uh, enzyme here called nitric oxide synthase uh, takes NADPH. There's that proton coming along for the ride. We oxidize it. If we oxidize it, something gets reduced. This time, arginine, the amino acid, gets reduced to citrulline. We will see uh, arginine and citrulline again in the urea cycle. So that's something we're going to see later on in the course. Um, and in turn, the oxygen gets converted to um, nitric nitric oxide. Okay. Now, this nitric oxide has a multitude of functions inside the cell, depending on what locality or um, cellular geography it's located. If you're talking about smooth muscle, it's a very good vasodilator, so it relaxes smooth muscles, activates cyclic GM, GMP. Um, Nitric oxide, in terms of the phagocyte, white blood cells, leukocyte can produce reactive nitrogen species, a respiratory burst in nitrogen, uh, different than the respiratory burst with oxygen. A uh, whole array of effects in the cell, again, usually mediated by the second messenger cyclic GMP. And usually nitric oxide, if you look at the Lewis structure of the molecule, it's very unstable. It has a half-life of about three to 10 seconds. However, in a leukocyte, uh, one of these immune system cells, where you need a respiratory burst, whether, a respirator, uh, whether it's reactive nitrogen or reactive oxygen species, an activated leukocyte can keep that half-life much, much longer in order to kill and eradicate bacteria. Other aspects of nitric oxide have to do with um, the blood system. Um, it is sort of a neurotransmitter uh, in the brain, so we have a nervous system functionality and um, this is what the uh, immune system reaction that I alluded to before with the production of reactive nitrogen species. So NADPH um, definitely involved in a whole array of functionalities, very different than NADH, um, very different in terms of the enzymes that it's a part of, reductive biosynthesis and very different in terms of sort of an immune system mediator in getting rid of the negative deleterious effects of free radical damage inside the cell. Uh, 